Welcome to Discovering. We're back with Bernie the Beekeeper for a springtime look at bees. Today we're going to be looking at the bees. We're going to do an inspection. We're going to check the brood. This is the, the beginning of the year for us and beekeepers across the UP and northern Wisconsin are now starting to look at their bees to see how they made it through the winter. And Kristen was in Marquette for a visit with Beth Milner and a look at handmade jewelry with a hint of spring. It's oftentimes I'm looking forward to what's going to happen next in nature. Sit back and relax. That's all tonight right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf. Lonesome trill, the eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. A while back, I was with beekeeper Bernie Driggs for a look at a unique setup for keeping bees over the long UP winters. After the show aired, it didn't take long to realize a tremendous amount of interest in bees and beekeeping here in the Upper Peninsula. So I'll be checking back with Bernie from time to time over the next few months to get an overall picture of what's involved. Here's where we were last time we were together. We went in and checked the bees and we fed them. Of course, now we're into spring and there's various skills or things that you have to do as a beekeeper depending on the season. Now we got to take this bee box off and then going through each of the uh, colonies to see what we have, see how strong they are, and see if the queen's laying, and readjust them and clean the hives. Whoo! A little bit. That's a little calmer. <clears throat> Ooh, this is empty, and that's good. What they do is after, when they're ready to, for the queen to lay an egg, it's got to be cleaned and polished each cell. So once it's cleaned and polished, she does an inspection on it, and then she'll go in and lay an egg. That's kind of what they're doing here. There's brood. You see the little white down in there? That's the larva. Here's sealed brood up here, and that's just larva. So we're probably getting into where she's working. I hate leaving it open like this so long. It's not good to be out too long and it'll, they'll get chilled brood. It'll actually kill the larva. This white stuff, a lot of that is that sugar I put in. The bottom board has to be opened up and cleaned and scraped clean of uh, dead bees. Over the winter, the uh, last year's bees will die and they fall to the bottom. And then we call it reversing the boxes. The bottom box becomes the top box. By nature, God wants them to go up. They start at the bottom and they work their way up. In order to encourage that, I reverse the boxes. This one is syrup and this one that is some crystallized honey. A couple weeks ago, I put, started putting honey on because they don't take syrup uh, until it gets warm out. Uh, the feeding isn't just to give them food. The feeding is stimulant. You stimulate the hive. The queen sees something's coming in, so she's more inclined to lay eggs. And right now you want her to really be laying a lot of eggs and getting up to that 2,000 a day. Right now they're bringing in pollen and of course there aren't any flowers blooming, so they're all coming from trees and bushes. The maple trees are a real big one for us and they're barely opening. So that's kind of the big thing and it's the first big push. Our second push is gonna be um, when the dandelions come out. You can almost get a box of honey off of dandelions if you have a strong overwintered colony. Once the queen starts to realize that stuff's coming in, she starts laying that 2,000 to 2,000 plus eggs a day. She should be laying pretty good right now, even with this little bit coming in. You need the queen to start laying because the hive is going to be declining. All the older bees are going to be dying, so we have to have uh, new bees to replace them. And with a life expectancy of two months, she needs to be laying that 2,000 a day in order for us to be at a 
60 or 70,000 by the 1st of July. Actually here, the 1st of July is when we get not only flowers, but we also get our basswood, which is a big, can be a very big flow here. We get lots of uh, honey off of basswood. Clover, as everyone knows, is a high producer of nectar for honey and gives a nice honey. Uh, but one basswood tree, and we got thousands of them around here. Uh, one basswood tree is worth two acres of uh, clover. It goes into a larva stage once it hatches. And the larva grows so fast. Um, I mean, it's fed constantly. There's bees in and out a hundred times a day feeding that larva. And they'll actually fill that cell. They'll go from that tiny egg, which is almost hard to see, um, to filling a cell. And then they cap it off, and that's called cap brood. And then that takes another 11 days, and then it hatches. And when it hatches, it eats its way out through that uh, wax on top, goes find something to eat, and then immediately starts feeding other bees. Um, I mean, they have this down to a science. The other thing they get from maple trees is their glue. It's called propolis. They glue everything together with propolis. I've read where they get some medicine from them too. Some people say that they have medicine chests inside the hive. So when they need medicine, they have it right there. And where the brood is, one thing you'll notice is that these are called 10 frame boxes, but I, I only have nine frames in them. Makes it a little easier to get everything in and out. It doesn't seem to, to hurt our harvest. There's larva in this one. So she's already laying. They're sealed brood here with the caps on. Those are sealed brood. Next to them, some larva. I don't know. I just got a feeling these queens are all laying late because of this odd winter, late drawn out spring. When you find them with their heads stuck into the cells, that means they starved to death. They ran out of food. And I had, I had sugar patties on here, but this was a very light hive to start with. It just didn't have much in it. And that's what we got. Here's where they, the bulk of them ended up. Right here. Look at that. And they just, there's no food here for them. And they can't go left and right. So they could starve to death if there was honey off to the left and right. Because they're designed to go up and down. They, and uh, especially when it's cold. It's cold, they can't, the cluster is how they stay together. And that's where they get their heat from. Now, what we have upcoming, well, first of all, is going to be the uh, package bees. That's the way most beekeepers get started in beekeeping is through package bees. Uh, thousands and thousands come out of California, Florida, and Georgia. Now, um, the neat part in this next one will be we're going to have a brand new beekeeper who has never done anything with bees, and he'll put in a package of bees. I'll do one first, he'll watch me, and I'll kind of talk him through the second one. You'll see how easy it is. After that, we're going to be doing um, a mite test, it's called a sugar roll, where you take uh, and put bees in a glass jar with powdered sugar and then you sprinkle some water on it. It's a neat procedure. Then we'll be looking at splitting a hive. If one of these can be split, we'll split it. Then we'll go into harvesting, where we actually take the honey off and extract it. From that, we'll go into bottling and, and doing a little selling and then start all over with reversing what we just did here. We'll be putting that bee box back on after we push these all together because they'll be all spread out. So uh, that's pretty much what we're gonna do. We're gonna take you through a whole season of beekeeping. Um, so, and that's it for now. The Upper Peninsula is home to many artists who seek inspiration around them, whether that's Lake Superior, the woods, trails, changing seasons, or our tiny feathered friends. I'm really excited for spring. So this is a series in particular, I like to feed birds at my house and I feel like it's so soon those hummingbirds will be here. I visited Beth Milner Jewelry in downtown Marquette to see for myself how Beth crafts her signature UP inspired jewelry. And so we're going to be cutting out these two hummingbirds today and we'll cut around the whole perimeter. So this is just a paper design that I made um, glued to a piece of sterling silver and I already drilled a couple holes through the back there. 
in order to have a spot to put the blade through. So first I'm going to put the saw blade in the jeweler's saw here. And I break lots of saw blades, it's part of the process, and we buy them by the gross. And I gotta kind of turn the blade around because these the beak is so sharp and the wing that I don't want to make like a rounded area. So I'm going to kind of back into this spot here and then start this way. Oftentimes people ask, well, how do you cut through metal? And it's, it's so silver is softer than steel and this blade is made of steel and it's got little tiny teeth on it. And so, um, you know, that's kind of steel is just a harder metal. So it'll cut through the silver. And then sometimes I'll reuse this part of the bird and I'll make a new little beak out of a piece of wire and solder that onto something too. So I like to kind of use both parts of the metal to kind of conserve, conserve as much effort. So next I'm gonna grind the stems of the flowers in here. And this is our little dust, dust collection because we want to be really safe not breathing in metals and sandpaper. So this is a stamp that I made um, out of a nail. So I filed the end to be shaped like a leaf. There's a lot of pre-made stamps um, that exist out in the world, but I really like using my own. Um, so it's more unique to my designs. So now we got our little stamps and I'll, I think I can pull the paper off now. So I often draw my designs um, in my sketchbook and then I'll use Photoshop to kind of lay them out as a paper template and change the scale of things so it can turn out a little nicer. So that's kind of uh, the leaves are stamped and the stems of the flowers are kind of ground in. So this is a rock here that I found um, in Marquette on the beach and it's a little bit hard to tell that it's an, it's an agate and some of the ones I find here aren't good quality so there might be lots of holes and pits or they'll break apart when I go to cut them but under a really good light with some water sprayed on the rock you can see that there's bands in here and little striations and this is a seam agate from what I know. So this was formed in the seam between two other kinds of rocks. Another thing with agates is that you can see the light coming through the rock. You can see this top part isn't translucent, so that's some other mineral that's with the agate. And it kind of helps you see maybe where you might cut them. There's this interesting shape over here that I might like. And you can see a little bit more bands here. This isn't a super high quality agate, but I like them because I'm finding them. So this little saw will um, use water to lubricate the blade while we're cutting, otherwise it'll heat up and it'll damage the stone. So we're, we're gonna kinda turn that on with the water at the same time. The agates are, are kinda cool. I like to think about how long they've been here and as I'm cutting into them, it's fun to kind of imagine like this material hasn't been exposed since dinosaurs were around maybe. That's kind of a, a crazy thought to me, but it's fun to think about the, the history and that I, I have the tools that can cut into these materials. And then we can see on the inside here that we've revealed some more stripes and maybe a little hole in there too. Fun to see the inside of a rock. The next step is um, attaching this rock to a rod and then I'll show you a little bit of the, the shaping of a rock. So I'm going to start on this far left wheel, which is a very coarse diamond wheel. They're actually all diamond wheels. And you can see I just took off that little high point there. I'm kind of trying to make it a little bit more regular. So once I kind of get a shape that I like on the perimeter, I started this one a little bit, but I took off kind of an angle around here. So I'm going to do a little bit more. I want to kind of start making it a bit more rounded. So I'm going to switch to just a slightly um, less coarse wheel so it doesn't tear into the rock too quickly. And now I'm going to kind of remove that area. There might be other rock cutters out there watching me and I am pretty new to this so shoot me a message if I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> and then I'm just going to use this grit to get the perimeter the same smoothness as the rest of it. And then we'll switch to a little bit finer of a grit. And 
Now we can see we've got a lot more regular of a shape and still got a little bit of a flat area on the top that I'm aiming to kind of smooth out in this next step here, making the curve more consistent. So we can see now we've got like a nice shape and it looks a little bit more typical to what would be used in a piece of jewelry. And then the next steps are really just going through all the different grits and really making that polish. Because if we were to dry this stone off and see it's really matte still and there's some defects that I would probably maybe change the whole shape of the stone so we don't have those. But then through the polishing process, so going through four or five more steps, we would be able to get that to a very shiny finished stone. Beforehand, I've formed these bezels, which is made from a strip of metal, and we're going to solder that onto the, the bottom of the piece here, and that's where the stone will go. I'm going to use the torch, and I'm going to pick up little balls of solder and place them inside of that bezel. I put them inside because I, if they spread out at all, then they're hidden under the stone versus um, kind of all over the surface of the pendant. Now I'm going to kind of heat this piece from below. You see, there it goes. And then we got that soldered onto the base. So I just dunked it in some water to kind of quench it and cool it off. And you can see that that's now soldered onto the bottom of the piece. And we'll be putting the stone inside of here and then pushing the metal over the edge of the stone to kind of hold it in place. So I've got the, the stone in there that we cut and the bezel height, the right height, so I can start to push that right up to the stone. A lot of stones can be set just with hand tools, but we tend to rely on tools like this to save our elbows and wrists and bodies um, by allowing a little bit of mechanical assist to, to do some of this work. So if anybody's ever seen a big pneumatic hammer, this is kind of like the teeny tiniest little version of it, or like a little jackhammer kind of. And when you're setting a stone, it kind of looks bad before it looks good. <laughs> so it'll look really dented and then we'll clean it up at the end. And now I'm gonna start to go kind of in an X shape and get those high points down too. Oftentimes people are like, oh, is the stone glued in there? And it's not, it's mechanically held by the metal, um, which glue can, you know, n stop working eventually. So I like to make pieces that really are long lasting. This next tool I'm going to use is called a bezel rocker, and I'm going to bring it up on edge here and kind of push that little bit of metal further down. So this kind of is smoothing the metal and compressing it by sort of pushing down and then rocking a little bit. I like this little agate that we picked here because it kind of matches the copper of the flowers too. I primarily work with some stones from the Keweenaw, from a couple that finds them, and they get some other stones from around the Lake Superior region. And then recently, I guess within the last six months here, I started going and finding my own agates and learning how to cut them too. So there's a quartz area in this agate, which is kind of interesting, and then there's little tiny bands up at the top, which um, are kind of typical of Lake Superior agates. Most of the agates, if, if anybody's a rock hound that's watching, are, are, um, that I'm finding here in Marquette are seam agates or moss agates, and there's many different kinds of Lake Superior agates. It's taken me a long time to even understand what I'm looking for, and I've added myself to a lot of groups online to see pictures of what the outside of an agate looks like um, to try and better pick them. By no means am I an expert yet, but I'm learning a lot about the ones that I'm finding here. The initial step was kind of pushing it in, but this is kind of pushing that top edge down to kind of better um, hold the stone and not have like an area where dirt can get kind of underneath the stone. So I'm trying to make it as sort of tight around there as possible. And then I'll do a little bit of sanding after that to kind of smooth out any tool marks on the, on the bezel and make it a little more consistent. I do a kind of brush surface on my pieces, so they're not super high polish. And I find that with silver, it is hard to keep a very high polish anyway, so it kind of lends itself to how the piece is being worn and not so much upkeep. So now this is ready for a patina. And the patina kind of darkens the detail, so it'll make the leaves a little bit darker um, and it'll darken around the flowers, but what'll happen is we'll get the whole piece dark um, with the patina and then we'll take 
um, the sort of high areas down so they're shiny again. So we start off with warm water and then we use a sulfur compound um, which is like a it's called liver of sulfur which is fairly non-toxic but we do have ventilation so we're not breathing fumes and then we're just going to take a paintbrush and put a little bit of this concentrated patina in the warm water and it smells like rotten eggs so you're probably glad that you can't smell it over the TV and then I'm going to paint it on the surface of the metal and you'll see the copper change color immediately because copper takes a patina really easily so at first it'll be kind of a yellow here and then as it sits on the piece you'll see it go almost to a dark brown and it'll get to like a slate gray is kind of the color we're going for and it seems to work better if it's being agitated a little bit on the surface most of this will come back off but the areas that are low and the between the petals of the flowers where I kind of want it dark this gives the piece a lot of depth makes the flowers kind of feel more alive popping off the surface so yeah, we'll basically leave that sit on there a little bit longer and then we'll take most of it back off just to give this piece a little bit more depth. And then we're just going to take some of this patina back off so we can see it's a little bit inconsistent. It's kind of different colors which are hard to preserve. So I'm just going to use this bristle disc and try and kind of clean some of it up. And then I'm just going to use this little polishing pad to kind of even out. So I could use a little more shining, but that kind of shows the, the final piece there too. These little flowers are made of UP copper. And there's a few more larger ones that have lilacs with them. Those are one of my favorite flowers, I think. They're, they're so early in the spring and they smell great. It's oftentimes I'm looking forward to what's going to happen next in nature. So it's, it's spring is kind of on the cusp here and I really um, am excited for that. That's my favorite time of year is when everything comes alive and we have flowers. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.